Welcome to our newest Fireside Chat program, which is sponsored by the National New Deal Preservation Association and its New Mexico chapter. I am Catherine Flynn, Executive Director of these two historical associations. We're currently celebrating the 90th anniversary of the inauguration of President Franklin Roosevelt and also the appointment of Francis Perkins as his Secretary of Labor on March the 4th, 1933. It's my pleasure to introduce a member of our national board, Christopher Bryseth, who will speak about Francis Perkins, FDR's Secretary of Labor for the entire Roosevelt presidency, and also the first woman cabinet member in American history. Christopher got to know Francis Perkins when he was a student at Carnell University, and Mrs. Perkins lived there the last five years of her life at Telluride House, a student residence at Carnell University, where Christopher also resided. Honoring that <clears throat> his close relationship with Secretary Perkins, Chris has worked over the past decade during his retirement to help develop the Francis Perkins Center at her homestead in Newcastle, Maine. In addition to serving on our NNDBA board for nearly two decades, Chris has also for seven years was the president and the CEO of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute, which is located at the FDR Presidential Library in Hyde Park, New York. Before that, Chris was a college president, first at Deep Springs College in California, then for 17 years at Wilkes University in Wilkes Springs, Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. He graduated from UCLA <clears throat> and received a master's degree in modern British history from Oxford University and a PhD in European intellectual history from Carnell. He taught history for 20 years before becoming a college administrator. So again, thank you, thank you to Kathy, who's been the leader of the NNDPA for more than a quarter of a century and has really started the process back then of, of focusing on the legacy of the New Deal, first in New Mexico, which had the distinction of having more New Deal investment per capita than any of the other 48 states at the time. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting Francis Perkins at Cornell at the Telluride House, which is a student house that um, focused on scholarship students uh, across the generations. We had undergraduates, freshmen, and we had graduate students. I entered as a graduate student. So it was my, uh, I, I entered as a slightly older person having graduated from UCLA. Uh, the house is self-governing and the Telluride Association, which owns the house, which is right in the center of the Cornell campus, uh, is run by the students. And and we had, and still do have faculty guests who are there for short terms, but we've had three long-term guests and Ms. Perkins is one of them. Uh, we heard that she was teaching at the aisle in our school and she was, for those of us who are interested in history on the campus, uh, she was, uh, obviously a, a wonderful focal point to understand the earlier history of the 20th century in America. So we decided to ask her down for dinner. And she came and she gave a talk and being the head of the faculty guest committee that introduced, invited her, it, it was my, I felt my obligation to ask the first question. So I said, Madam Perkins, I didn't know that that was not her preferred 
appellation. She liked Miss Perkins. I said, Madam Perkins, what do you regard as your greatest success and contribution? Two words. She said, social security. And indeed, that began my orientation into her extraordinary career. After she'd had that first dinner with us, the house met and we we discussed whether we should invite her to be one of our guests. Um, she was then living in a residential facilities far away from campus, a kind of a very colorless brick apartment building. And she had to be driven to campus from there for whatever she needed to do on campus. So she came uh, to dinner and I had worked out with her boss, Morris Neufeld, uh, that we were going to ask her to live with us. After dinner, we went upstairs and I showed her the room that she would have in the corner of uh, room 16 on the second floor. And I, I explained the general situation. She said, well, how much will it cost? I said, oh, we're all here on room and board scholarship. Well, her eyes lit up. And knowing now more about her life, uh, along with all the other stresses and tragedies she coped with, she was under constant financial strain. So the thought of not only having all her costs taken care of, but that she would have her meals prepared was great. She was not known as a cook. So uh, we, and the, and the waiters, by the way, who brought her breakfast in bed, or at least brought to her room, called her perk, which as you heard in the slideshow, is what her classmates at Mount Holyoke called her. Uh, it was an interesting natural response to her. She was perky. Um, well, as she became part of the house, she came to our house meetings, every Monday night. Um, she didn't speak. She knew that that was not her place, but because she was so deaf, her whispers were ones that we, we could hear. And I, when she arrived in the fall of 1960, I was on my way as a Telluride scholar to Oxford. So I only spent a couple of weeks in the house while she moved in. When I came back two years later, uh, the House had made a decision uh, to admit women. And I think this would be the first residential facility in America on a campus that had both men and women. And when I got back, she said, Chris, what do you, um, what do you think about admitting women? I said, I think, I think it's great. She said, you'll be sorry. I said, why will I be sorry? And she said, because the women will take over. Now there's several Telluriders on this uh, talk today and you, they, they could testify as to whether that's been the case. Anyway, we've had wonderful women leaders of Telluride over the years. I tell that because as the first woman cabinet member, um, Frances Perkins, learned how to, to to deal with men and she she found many ways to fit in as the only woman as you saw in the picture the cabinet she was the only woman among all those men and she's very sensitive about not not sort of fouling the nest if i can use that so she she was very careful. When she learned early, when she became a lobbyist for the, for the National Consumer League in Albany, her first big success was to get the 54-hour act passed, uh, limiting the hours for women. She succeeded by persuading the head of Tammany Hall uh, to, to vote for this legislation. Um, and she learned with men like the McManus, who was one of the head men of Tammany, that if she reminded them of her mother, 
of their mother uh, that they would be less threatened by her and more comfortable in her presence. She shifted from those rather coquettish clothes you saw in the slideshow when she was a student at Mount Holyoke. And she wore very severe black skirts, white blouses with her pearls, almost almost always. That was her, her outfit. She would, uh, on formal occasions, she'd put things very, a colorful jacket. Uh, she had a lovely one that she wore when she was at Telluride House that uh, was, was from China, multicolored. It was, it was really beautiful. And she always wore her, her, even in the house, she wore her tricorn hat, which her mother had persuaded her to wear because her large, wide forehead, she wanted to uh, soften that in the way her face was presented. So Frances learned how to present herself to the world and how to present herself to the, to the world of men. And she, um, she kept little notes about, about men and how to understand men. So it was, a, for her, it was as much a study as it was that earlier study in chemistry and biology, and then sociology and economics at Columbia. Uh, one of the things that characterized her from the time at Mount Holyoke, then through all the experiences which we saw in the slideshows to Chicago, to Philadelphia, to New York, and then we working in Albany was to apply a social science point of view to the systems of the country, the and particularly to understand the systemic poverty uh, of our big cities. Uh, and she focused on the cities more than on, on rural America. Uh, she found that that being a social worker, which she had trained to be, uh, it was not enough to minister to that woman at Hull House who had five children and a drunken husband. Um, she needed to get at the systemic causes of poverty in America. And she studied that with, with great severity and, and uh, attention. She interacted with others who were in the new field of social science, uh, whether it was economics or sociology or psychology. And by the time she got to New York, she was already uh, a serious student of how America worked and how it didn't work. I'm gonna say more about that in a minute. But back at the house, uh, one of the things that she did out of gratitude for living there and, and having the companionship of young students, which she really enjoyed, um, she gave us a fresh lobster dinner once a year with champagne. The drinking age was 18 at New York at that time. And she then at graduation each year to the undergraduates, that is seniors, not us graduate students, she gave them a copy of, of Gratian's manual, um, which was, a, I will read the frontis page to let you know what it was. The truth telling manual and the art of worldly wisdom being a collection of the aphorisms which appear in the works of Balthazar Gratian of the Company of Jesus and Reader in Holy Scripture in the College of Tarragona, under, translated from 1653 Spanish text. So this is like Machiavelli's The Prince. It's, it's a guide, in his case, The Prince, but this is a more general guide. And I'm gonna read you two excerpts that she underlined. I discovered her copy because when I went to, to be part of the Francis Perkins Center, I stayed with her grandson uh, at the homestead, which is about to be open to the public as a national historic site. And I found this Gratian's manual and I found her underlinings. Well, these are two places where she underlined. Discover each man's thumbscrew. It is the way to move his will. 
more skill than force being required to know how to get at the heart of anyone. There's no will without its leanings, which differ as desires differ. All men are idolaters, some of honor, others of greed, and the most of pleasure. The trick lies in knowing those idols that are so powerful, thus knowing the impulse that moves every man. It is like having the key to another man's will, with which to get at the spring within by no means always his best, but more frequently his worst, for there are more unholy men in the world than holy. Divine the ruling passion of a man, excite him with a word, and then attack him through his pet weaknesses. That invariably checkmates his free will. And then do nothing to make you lose respect for yourself or to cheapen yourself in your own eyes. Let your own integrity be the standard of rectitude and let your own dictates be stricter than the precepts of any law. Forgo the unseemly more because of this fear of yourself than for fear of the sternness of outer authority. Learn this fear of yourself and there will then be no need for that imaginary monitor of Seneca. So that she passed on to each of the graduating seniors. Uh, I think it, it, it was an example of her as our teacher. Um, and, and she became invested in the lives of almost every student there. As I got back from Oxford and got to know her, and I, I would spend after dinner, we'd go to the living room and I would just ask her one question after another. While I was studying European history, my interest was enough in American history. And I, I realized that how, what an extraordinary resource we had access to. Well, I said, you know, could, do you think you could get your friend Henry Wallace to come over here for a seminar? And she thought that was a great idea. And she and Henry Wallace were each other's best friends on Roosevelt's cabin. Um, and they both, by the way, had converted from she from Congregationalism and he from Methodism and became Episcopalianism and, and ser ser serious Episcopalians. So um, she said, the boys will be very disappointed, Henry, if you don't come. Well, he he responded to her invitation and he came and we had an extraordinary two-day seminar with him. He did not want to talk about the New Deal. He wanted to talk about strawberries, which as a plant geneticist, he was he was fascinated with it and he was trying to find, uh, develop a strawberry for the Caribbean that could become a cash crop. Um, extraordinary man. Um, and I ran the seminar, so I was dealing with these two New Dealers. Uh, two, two points that I think, and if you've read my essay, the, the Francis Perkins I Knew, which I wrote right after she died, I spent a couple of pages on the seminar, but they clearly had different ideas about, about rural and urban America. And Francis, although she lived in small towns, she was an urban, urban woman and thought it was a great place to learn to grow up. Whereas Henry was a farmer and his, fa his family had been farmers back through the generations. His father had been Secretary of Agriculture in the Republican administrations of the 20s. And he became Roosevelt's Secretary of Agriculture for the first eight years. Uh, he just didn't feel America could be America with only 5% of the population living on the land. Um, so they had a, an interesting debate about that. The moment that, that I want to recall is, is that um, at the very end, I, I, asked, I asked what they thought was the contribution that President Roosevelt had made. And, and Mr. Wallace immediately said it was providential for America. This comes coming from the Episcopalian. It was providential for America. He gave the country hope. And then he said, Francis, do you remember when we stood next to each other at the gravesite of Franklin Roosevelt? 
And do you remember when you crossed yourself what you said? And she kind of was startled as if in front of all this group of students that he invaded her privacy and she was a very private person. And she said, well, yes. I said, rest his soul. And he said, and you said it as if he was a very rest, restless soul. That his was a very restless soul. So I got a, a, a sense of the these two people who who worked together over 12 years. And I am happy that on on the listeners list today is Der, is Derek Liebert, whose new book just came out on Un unlikely heroes of Franklin Roosevelt, his four lieutenants and the world they made. And it focuses on Perkins, Hop Hopkins, Ickes, and Wallace. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful read. And I would, I would say there are three books. If you want to know more about Francis Perkins, the first, of course, is her own book, the Franklin Roosevelt I knew, the Roosevelt I knew. And the second is, was the really the critical book that started bringing Francis back into the public light. And this is The Woman Behind the New Deal by Kirsten Downey, who's a dear friend and a member of our Francis Perkins Center board. Derek's book has just come out this past week. And there's one phrase that I want to read or one very short paragraph. It gives you a sense of how he, and his book shows these four lieutenants that are with Roosevelt from the very first all the way through till his death. And they stick together, all of their rivals, they often are angry with each other, but on the four sets of shoulders, they really carry us through the depression and World War II. He says, as for Perkins, FDR already understood her at least as well as he did the others. And he was pleased that her appointment set a historic precedent. Even so, he no more grasped her full significance than did any of the other men in his administration. For by her example, Perkins was dynamizing a generation. And I, I think the impact she had on bringing women into positions of responsibility and power and focusing on this condition of women uh, in the workplace, but also as, as mothers and homemakers was critical. And at the point that she accepted Roosevelt's invitation, of course, she'd served him as his industrial commissioner in New York State uh, for four years and then moved seamlessly to that as Secretary of Labor, um, she really didn't want to do it. Her husband, who was bipolar manic depressive, in and out of institutions, a daughter who was a teenager and herself was, was showing some emotional problems. To move from New York to Washington was gonna be a great, great sacrifice. And she wanted to be sure that it was worth it. And so she listed the requirements of things that, that she would want to pursue as Secretary of Labor. Um, and in effect made that the condition for accepting this position and the tremendous burden this was gonna put on her life. And in Kirsten Downey's book, at the very beginning, in this book, I can't overemphasize how important this book has been in, in bringing Frances Perkins back to light. She, on her first page, she talks about her visit with the president-elect in his house on East 65th Street. <coughs> she ticked off the items she would require his support of. A 40-hour work week a minimum wage, workers' compensation, unemployment compensation, a federal law banning child labor, direct federal aid for unemployment relief, social security, a revitalized public employment service, and health insurance. 
And he was responsive and said that um, he would, she had to do it on her own, but he would support her. She could get the support. And they went through, the one thing that is not listed there by Kirsten is a health ser service. And one of her goals was to be a national health plan. And they had to give that up in the, in the social security bill of 1935 because the doctors opposed this as socialized medicine. So the, uh, the but every other thing she asked for was at least begun, uh, if not totally in force. A remarkable um, set of, of, of plans. She herself said frequently that there was no plan for the New Deal, uh, that they got together and they, it was trial and error. Uh, each of these four people that uh, Derek Liebert has, has focused on had plans of their own, for things that they wanted to do. Harry Hopkins with employment. Uh, of the unemployed, um, but Francis witnessed the Triangle Fire on March 25th, 1911, and she became the executive of the of the Legislative Factory Inve Investigation Commission, with her two bosses being Al Smith and Robert Wagner, who were head of the two houses of the legislature in New York. And out of that work, which by the way, she was recommended for this job by Theodore Roosevelt, 30 pieces of legislation resulted, which became the progressive tradition that Al Smith then pursued when he became governor. Um, and if you think about it, she's a bull moser in 1912 with Teddy Roosevelt, although she couldn't vote the time. She comes through the whole Al Smith set of governorships, and she is the ideas in the Smith administration. She then moves to the Roosevelt governorship, where they hit the Depression, and New York is way ahead of every other state in responding to the needs of the people of New York. And then she has the 12 years with Roosevelt. So she is the progressive tradition from Theodore Roosevelt through Al Smith and Franklin Roosevelt. Um, there's no other person that tra traverses that span from 1912 to 1945. Well, of course, labor was a very important part of it, and labor unions. And there was one story that, that um, I, I had experience I had with her. Uh, at the house, uh, at Telluride House, we often provided receptions for major speakers who uh, came to campus and the, the administration would say, would you hold, hold a reception? I don't remember, by the way, for those of you who are Telluriders listening to this, whether they ever reimbursed us or whether we footed the bill ourselves. In any event, it was 1963, spring of 63, which, by the way, I think is when when she and Jackie Kennedy were together, not 1960, because Jack, Jack was not yet president in 1960. But in any event, um, Jimmy Hoffa was coming to campus. And at that time, as the leader of the Teamsters, um, he was in a fallout war with Bobby Kennedy, who was the attorney general. And Bobby Kennedy was attempting to show that uh, Hoffa was part of the mafia and had used funds, union funds in an illegal way. Um, so the question was, should we invite Hoffa down for a reception? And we knew there was going to be a huge crowd. So I was having lunch with Miss Perkins and another hot faculty guest who was himself uh, had been from Vienna. He was Jewish. He'd had to leave Vienna because of the Nazis. He had, at the point he was on leave uh, at Cornell from being head of the public health service in New York City. Brilliant, brilliant man. Um, 
but he had this background in Europe that was relevant. And I said, Miss Perkins, do you, do you think we should invite Jimmy Hoffa for a reception? And before she could answer, Dr. Racker, his name is Ephraim Racker, said, no, he is the Hitler of the American labor movement. And Ms. Perkins said, no, not Dr. Racker. You know, they used to say that about John L. Lewis. But you know, John L. Lewis became known as a statesman of the American labor movement. And she said, if Jimmy Hoffa lives long enough, I dare say he'll be known as a statesman of the American labor movement. We, I took that as a go ahead that we, we could, <laughs> We could invite Mr. Hoffa. Uh, well, we got involved with the Teamsters security people, people that were not protecting him when he went to Detroit at the end of his life. Uh, and they ransacked our our closets, our, our dressers, drawers and things to see if there were any explosives or anything else. So Hoffa comes down, we have probably 150 people. The house is is expansive. Part of the design of it by the by the founder was that it would be an elegant place for young men to learn to meet influential people who could set the uh, be mentors to them. And Hoffa was was there, and he said he wanted to meet Madame Perkins, and we'd already asked whether she would want to meet him, and she said no. She didn't. She was going to. Washington the next day, and she's going to bed early. Well, his people came back to us and said, he really wants to meet Madam Perkins. So we called up on the intercom, which was an old 1910 intercom, very sophisticated in this day. She got on the phone and, and was asked again. She said, no, I've, I've already ready for bed. Uh, I'm not coming down. Hoffa's people insisted that he really wanted to meet her. So one of our housemates, Hisao Fujimoto, went up, and I don't, in my time, I never knew anyone to knock on her door rather than call her up by phone, except the, the waiters who brought her the food. And um, she, he said, Miss Perkins, Mr. Hoffa really insists that you come. She said, who the hell told him I lived here? Well, anyone on campus who knew that Frances Perkins was there knew she lived at Telluride House. So she said, but never let it be said that a former Secretary of Labor refused to meet a major labor leader. So she got dressed, put on a tricorn hat, and she came. And I met her at the bottom of the stairs. And she, we walked in, and the place was packed. And people made a path for her, like the, like the Red Sea being spread. And he jumped up out of his sofa, and he reached his his very large working man's hand grabbed hers and said, Madam Perkins, I always wanted to meet you to tell you how good you've done in ending unemployment. And she said, come now, Mr. Hoffa, the New Deal did an unemployment, World War II and unemployment. Um, and, uh, excuse me, sir, I'm on a Zoom call. Um, so in that, she, she in effect was saying, World War II was what allowed us to come out of the unemployment of the Depression. She turned before there was any chance for a picture to be taken. And all she's almost blind at this point. She walks back and under the arch before the staircase, she sees this very tall man. And she says, she recognized him as the Teamsters lawyer. She said, tell me, Mr. Zagreb, are the Teamsters still hijacking trucks? In New Jersey to organize. So with that, she went back to bed having paid her honor to the Teamsters. So we had experiences like that that were showed us how commanding she was, how how astute she was in reading people. Uh, she was very witty. She told a wonderful story. At our receptions, she was virtually always there. Um, often first and would we would have sherry uh, so i kind of assumed it that being a good i thought i thought her as a boston lady it was it's in my article 
which was something that was just not true. She was born in Boston. But that was not uh, her real main and New York were her real roots. In any event, um, I assumed that sherry was what she drank. At Oxford, that's what we did before dinner. We would have sherry. So when she went out to L.A. to give a lecture at UCLA, I asked my parents if they would have a dinner party for her. And they said, of course. And I asked if her if she would be willing to dine at my family. And she said, of course. So my parents went out and bought the best crystal sherry glasses, and they got the best cream, medium, and dry sherry, and had it propped up on the bar in our house in L.A. And my father picked her up in Westwood and was taking her by the arm and said, Ms. Per Madam Perkins, uh, would you like some sherry? And she said, well, that's, that's fine. If that's all you have. I usually have bourbon and branch water. Well, Tomlin, her grandson, and I have agreed that that story is sufficient evidence to con to challenge the historians that indicate that the night before Christmas, when she locked the, the committee that was developing Social Security uh, at her house and put a put a bottle of whiskey down and that they were not to leave until the bill was prepared for the president. It was said that it was scotch. Well, two things. I knew that bourbon and branch water was her drink. And when we had a full bar, that is what she drank. And I also knew that she couldn't stand Joe Kennedy. And of course, Joe Kennedy was identified with scotch and its importation by which he made a lot of money. So anyway, that one tiny bit of evidence I would use to confound the historians. Now, that's that's the kind of the base of my experience with her. As I have, and, and some quick pictures, um, you can't see these very well, but that at least shows this is the group she lives with and she's there in the lower cor corner. And that was, Last year, just before she died, this was the picture. Um, and when we had the seminar with Henry Wallace, here are the two of them with one of our Telluride students, Bob King. But you can see how comfortable they are with each other, both smiling. Uh, they clearly they were devoted friends. Um, I give a lot of talks on Francis Perkins, um, and I begin it usually with this quotation, which comes from Nan Cohen, who we invited to one of our Francis Perkins Center meetings in Bar Harbor in Maine, uh, and I'd asked her to reflect on the role that Francis Perkins had in re spreading the crack in the glass ceiling for women. And Ann Cohen was president of Wellesley for I think 12 years, and then went on to be president of Duke University um, for 10 years. It was really, ha has been, still is, one of the major female leaders in our society. Here's what she said. Francis Perkins was the true pioneer. Of course, there had been strong women leaders before her. Cleopatra, Elizabeth of England, Catherine the Great, Abbas Hildegard of Bingham, M. Carey Thomas at Bryn Mawr, Jane Addams at Hull House, and Florence Nightingale. Yet each of these impressive leaders had the opportunity to lead either A, because dynasty trumped gender, and their royal blood made them female ruling monarchs, or B, they were savvy enough to take advantage of marriage to ruling men and succeed them in power, or C, they rose to prominence in areas traditionally associated with women, nursing, social work, convents, and women's college. And now this sentence, Perkins was probably the very first woman 
in the history of the modern nation state to occupy an official position of significant political power because of her own qualifications and accomplishments. To me, that, that captures what were really was her major breakthrough. She, as a social scientist and a person who understood political power, who could deal with the men of Tammany Hall, and who saw that pu public policy was the way you dealt with the systems of the country that needed reform. Of course, there was a, there was a hubbub when she became Secretary of Labor. Um, and as early as August of 33, Time Magazine put her on the cover. And Derek Liebert and his new book shows the Time cover, color, cover for each of the four lieutenants, as he calls them, of FDR. Well, inside this article, here is what the Time Magazine, this is how Henry Luce, uh, for those of you who remember the history of Time Life, he was a very, very conservative man, husband of Claire Booth Luce. It is no accident that the resurgence of labor coincides with the presence in the cabinet of its first woman and she in the labor department. In Madam Secretary Perkins is concentrated all the philosophy of the New Deal and most of its instinctive sympathy for the working man. Early and late, she has served as his able, articulate spokesman around the cabinet table before ca congressional committees at NRA, that is National Recovery Administration uh, hearings on the stump. And this is the key part. For the first time in years, the working man may feel that there is a trained mind functioning for him in Washington. Gone are the easy platitudes of the politician. Miss Perkins speaks the idiom of the advanced welfare worker, the scientific sociologist. And I think it's interesting that Ickes, Hopkins, and Perkins were all social workers. And as people that helped transform the policies, which we know as the New Deal, um, this is, it is striking that they were social workers. It was a new dimension of social work grounded in, in the social sciences. Throughout the 12 years, she is one of the most uh, private counselors to President Roosevelt. And in her book, which the Francis Perkins, or excuse me, the Roosevelt I Knew, which comes out a year after his death, and still is regarded as one of the best, most insightful portraits of this very interesting and contradictory man that led us through these two great struggles, the Great Depression and World War II. Frances Perkins is, is a controversial figure. She doesn't get along with the press. <coughs> um, She's, they try to impeach her uh, in the Congress. And by 1944, and by the way, she tries to retire in 1940. And Roosevelt gets Fra Eleanor to persuade her that she cannot. She's got to stay uh, serving the president and the country. So in 44, uh, as the convention happens and Roosevelt is elected for the fourth term, Collier's Magazine comes out with an, an article, which is the woman nobody knows. And so this is after tw almost 12 years, they're pointing to the fact that she is still not known. And they this is their observation. After going through the several points which she had requested Roosevelt approve if she were to accept as Secretary of Labor. And she was not she was not quiet about that, by the way. It is not possible to obtain confirmation of Miss Perkins' 
statements from the president that if her memory is correct, what this country has been operating under for the past 12 years is not so much the Roosevelt New Deal as it is the Perkins New Deal. For the platform in which Ms. Perkins says Mr. Roosevelt implied his approval is the price of her acceptance of the labor post forms the veritable foundation of the New Deal. Take it away and there would be no New Deal. No one in Washington seems able to understand why credit has been withheld from Ms. Perkins for so many years. The president has often spoken kindly, Harry Hopkins and other New Deal advisors, and on occasion has even patted them benignly on the back. But kind words from Ms. Perkins have been exceedingly rare. She has been pilloried as incompetent and worse, but no adequate defense of her has been forthcoming from the White House. And part of why I'm thrilled at these books that are coming out and at the Francis Perkins Center where we're opening the homestead, which was her really her family's home since 1750, is that we are recovering the reputation and of, of a woman uh, who is virtually forgotten to history. You can go through the major books on the New Deal and if they have her at all, if I, and I always go right to the index, if they have her at all, it's, it's, she's identified with Social Security, but you can have a book that, it, that deals with Social Security and its significance for our social safety net. Um, and, and her name won't be, even be mentioned. Well, that's changing, and and it's it's thrilling. Um, I'm going to read two more things uh, before we go to questions. One is I had a fairly extensive correspondence with her after I left Cornell. I went to teach at Williams College, and I actually got her to come over as my guest to give a lecture at Williams. So we had a wonderful time for th over three days there. Well, after President Roosevelt, uh, President Kennedy was killed, I wrote her a letter of condolence, and this was her response. And I think you can you can see the tone of her language in a private correspondence. You can't think how much I appreciated your note, or how much help it gave me to hear from another human creature, also in pain and horror and shame over the assassination. I still can hardly believe it, two exclamation points. Telluride took it hard. They're so young and not inured to grief. Paul Wolfowitz, house president, did his part nobly. Several boys obviously grew up in those three days. The university called a memorial meeting for Saturday a.m. It was extremely good. Clinton Rossiter, Cornell professor of American institutions, was the only speaker, and he was brilliant. He satisfied the mind and the emotions also. They're printing it, and I'll send you a copy. It's been a hard fortnight. This boy in demand, so young, with a life ahead of him, so intelligent, so dedicated. In some ways, one feels as at the Roosevelt death, but there was no murder then to add horror and confusion. I never doubted that the country and its institutions and ways of living would survive, but was startled and even annoyed that some people seem to think America is over. I think that is why all the European rulers came to bolster up our nerve. Thanks so much for writing. It helps a lot. Fondly, Francis Perkins. And then she, she did Tarmans in 1944. Uh, to retire after Roosevelt is elected to a fourth term. And in December 1, she writes a five page letter, single space, and goes over what they'd accomplished in the Department of Labor um, under his leadership. And it's really, as someone who was so private and she would tear a photographer's camera away from him, pull out, pull out the film if he didn't ask to take her picture first, uh, I think this is her immortality document. 
and it's it's available on the website of the Francis Perkins Center. Um, uh, and it it goes through all the things that she asked to do back in February of 1933. And there are a couple themes in here that I want to underscore. It's been an exceptional experience to work with you in these historic times, and particularly in the Department of Labor, where so many of the problems and so many of the projects for change and improvement in social, economic, and industrial practices have necessarily been centered. It's been my privilege to explore and report on these problems for you and to assist you in the development of practical measures for their amelioration through legislation, administrative practice, and social education. Now, this is the part I want you to focus on. The marked improvement in the condition of work and living, which the plain people of this country now enjoy, the significant new humane democratic and fraternal attitude with which most Americans now regard not only these new practices, but also their fellow citizens. And evidence is evidence not only of the success of your leadership in this field, but also of a vast gain in true civilization in these 12 years. These social and economic reforms of the past 12 years will be regarded in the future as a turning point in our national life, a turning from careless neglect of human values and toward an order voluntarily established by the people through representative government of mutual and practical benevolence within a free competitive industrial economy. And she frequently said that she came to Washington, see if I can find the exact quote. She came to Washington to work for God, FDR, and the millions of forgotten, plain, common working men. So I turn to your questions. And TJ Walker is going to so select them for me. And, and again, his grandfather was Frank Comerford Walker, who was one of Roosevelt's closest friends in the first administration, became the fellow who put together the concept of the, of the presidential library in 1938, uh, which became the FDR library, and was throughout the war the postmaster general uh, of the United States through wartime, Frank C. Walker. So TJ, quest questions? Great job, Chris. And uh, first of all, we have a couple listeners who were whose mother and grandmothers went to Mount Holyoke with uh, Francis, uh, Pamela Benstein and Peter Smith, I thought were, uh, <clears throat> whose family were very acquainted with uh, Francis. <clears throat> we have a few questions regarding Francis's relationship uh, with Governor Roosevelt in New York. Uh, especially her involvement in uh, altering social policies on the state level. Okay. Um, Peter Smith, by the way, emailed me earlier today. So hello, Peter. Um, I'd love to be in touch with you further. Uh, she continued. Al Smith had brought her on the Industrial Commission as one of five members. And in 1926, he made her the chair, which was really the first time a woman in this country had carried such a major public responsibility. And as I said, the, the, the um, program of the Smith administration carried over uh, into the Governor Roosevelt's administration. They, of course, were faced with massive unemployment after October 29 with a crash. Um, so uh, many of the things that she helped put together were the, the unemployment uh, bureaus for the state of New York, which took care of, of established rights for unemployment insurance in New York. Um, and she, uh, of course, 
continued to work on the conditions of workplace safety, fire safety. Uh, and, and as a social scientist, she was particularly keen uh, on statistic, statistics. And um, Isidore Lubin, who during the presidential years was the director of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which, which was the Cadillac of government statistical uh, collections. In January of 1930, the depression having hit in October, President Hoover came out confidently and said the employment statistics showed that things were improving. And Perkins, who was watching these statistics in New York like a hawk, knew this was not true. She checked with some of her colleagues in other states. And without telling Roosevelt, she called a press conference and she challenged the president's statistics and realized afterwards that maybe, maybe she should, shouldn't have done this on her own. She called up the governor and she said, Governor, are you in a good mood? And he said, why, Francis? She said, I've been very naughty. And so she describes what he she has done, and he says, bully, sort of aping his cousin Theodore. And he said, it's a good thing you didn't ask me, because I probably would have said no. But uh, you will be responsible for this, but I'm glad you did it. Well, that tells you that she was dealing with economic policy. She was dealing with uh, how to report it. She was tracking what was happening to the unemployed. She was working with people like Harry Hopkins, who was who literally was working to deal with unemployed people in a program called acronym was Terry Terra T E R A, which he then, by the way, under her auspices, introduces him again to Roosevelt in, in Washington, and he begins doing that work uh, in Washington with the with the first emergency employment program and the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, which he and Francis helped put together, and finally with the WPA. Next There's one. another question in the same regard, um, her relationship with Tammany Hall, person wanted to know. Well, we, we have just recently celebrated the naming of Francis Perkins Place um, in New York uh, in the block, I think it's 9th and West 43rd Street. <clears throat> uh, Tomlin Kagashal is on the line. He, he will know it, but he's not in a position to correct me. But this is, this is the block where Tammany Hall had his headquarters and it was, it was where the settlement house, Hartley House, which still exists, it's where Frances uh, first lived when she came to New York City from Philadelphia. Um, Smith was really her teacher, Al Smith, when he was head of the assembly in the legislature. And as she was working on the issues that came out of the Fractory Investigating Commission dealing with sa safety and working conditions, um, the 54-Hour Act became her first real effort. And what she had to learn uh, from Smith was that you've got to go and, and deal with Tammany. He and Wagner were called the Tammany Twins. So the Democratic Party at that point was Tammany Hall in New York State. And of course, the, the progressives were very negative about them, saw them as the source of corruption and undue influence. But what Smith was himself had no formal education. He said the Fulton Fish Market was his university. Um, he said, you know, these are the people you've got to deal with if you're going to get legislation through. So he began introducing her to people, uh, including the people of Tammany. And the McManus was the, the great, he wasn't number one, but I think he was number two. And so her interaction with him 
and I'm forgetting the name of the top guy, but she also met with him, very sober, austere kind of guy. And she learned how to get comfortable with those those men. And I think, sort of splitting off from that a bit, how she learned to deal with men, I think, is is a central part of the Francis Perkins story. <laughs> and Kirsten Downey deals a great deal with this and how, how Miss Perkins made the adjustment as she became more and more part of the world of politics, um, of, of how, to, how to deal with men. That's why the Gratian's Manual, I think, is so revealing because it, it's, it's all, all male metaphors throughout the whole manual. So uh, she, 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 rather than being a purist who wouldn't deal with Tammany, they were human beings. They, they were taking responsibility for the people in their neighborhoods. Uh, she worked with them, and she, she in, increased the public policy support of poor people because she worked with Tammany. Any other questions? Uh, one, one, a couple others, but uh, from John Sears and myself, actually, I was interested in uh, Francis's relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt. You had mentioned something earlier, but can you uh, say anything more about her relationship? Yes. And this is John Sears' book, a wonderful book on Eleanor. Oh. Um, Refuge must be given. Eleanor Roosevelt, the Jewish plight, and the founding of Israel. Um, Eleanor and Francis are, I think, the way the historians are now telling the story, they are politically probably the two most important women in the 1920s and 30s in terms of American politics uh, and public life. And Eleanor's great strength, of course, is, is not only uh, her own background as the niece of Theodore Roosevelt, who gave them away, by the way, in their wedding on St. Patrick's Day, 1905, but as the wife of Franklin Roosevelt, she becomes first a first lady in New York, and then she becomes first lady in the country. And by the end of her life, Adlai Stevenson will refer to her as the first lady of the world. So she, from the position of privilege in her life, but also of her marriage, uh, has, has access increasingly to people around the world. And she's the one who really leads the effort in the United Nations to create the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which I think personally is going to be increasingly the uh, standard by which regimes are measured if we if if we have a positive future um there was there was some tension between and by the way behind me you see a um, a portrait of Francis Perkins which is a photograph of a painting done by Ruth Munsell who's about to publish a book for young people on Francis Perkins. And I, I think she has captured her marvelously. And so I, I live with Francis in my den here. Um, on the morning, well, you say that, and Derek makes this point in the book, she has a portfolio, the Secretary of Labor. I mean, she, she has power. She has a position granted by our the constitution. Um, and while she didn't always get her way, she could bring legislation to bear. She could interact with other people of power. Uh, one of the great examples is that she's at tea with, um, at the time that they're putting social security together and they can't figure out how they're gonna get past this hostile Supreme Court to make it constitutional. And the, and the Supreme Court Justice who's there, she says, leans into her and says, it's the taxing authority, my dear, the taxing authority. And so the payroll tax of Social Security 
becomes how that clears the hurdle of being constitutional. Um, so she's got power. Eleanor has power by her reputation and her persuasion, her her warmth with people. I mean, she the, her first press conference in 1933 is held before FDR has his first press concert, and you have to you have to be a woman to be at her press conference. So she forces papers all over the country to hire women reporters. So she has power of that kind, but it's not the kind that Francis has. So when Eleanor invites Francis to come to teas that she has for the wives of cabinet members, Francis has a, a mixed feeling. You know, she doesn't have a spouse uh, to bring to that. She has a spouse, but he's incapacitated. So that's just a, maybe a little hint that Francis, as a cabinet member, is, is not just a woman friend of Eleanor, although she is that, um, but she has a standing. Um, if, you, if you read Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, No Ordinary Time, she opens it with the, uh, the effort of Francis to, at Roosevelt's request, to get Eleanor to come to the convention in Chicago in 1940, where she gives the speech, these are no ordinary times. Um, Franklin uses Eleanor to get Francis to remain the Secretary of Labor in 1940, which Perkins really does not want. Um, so they, you can, I can go through about five instances where the two of them, Eleanor and Francis, are actually crucial to each other and to the president. Um, uh, when he was governor, she had a little, Eleanor had a little bedroom up kind of in the attic. They, of course, were no longer a conjugal couple. Um, and Francis would have a space to sleep up there, and they would have these long talks at night. And, and um, often, Eleanor was very self-pitying uh, about that she'd never had a home of her own. And here she now was in the, the uh, executive mansion, and in time would become in the White House. So the morning after Mrs. Roosevelt dies, I know that two weeks before, Mrs. Roosevelt had asked Frances Perkins to come to see her in New York. She wanted to talk about some very private matters, which when Frances came back, she shared with us were about finances. She didn't tell what, but um, so I knew that the two of them had been in touch as Mrs. Roosevelt was dying. And I called up on our intercom at 7.30 in the morning. And I said, you've heard that Mrs. Oh, she said, Ms. Perkins said, I've been on the phone for hours. Um, and before I could say any more, she said, you know, there could be a lot of talk about how much Mrs. Roosevelt did for the world. But I've known her long enough to know how much she did for herself. And then she quickly elaborated on that to say, I remember her when she was the First Lady of New York, and she was very oppressed by her circumstances and her, her mother-in-law being the head of her household, raising her children, mother-in-law raising her children. She said, I'm so glad that the service is going to be at Hyde Park as we had it for the president um, and not at a big church in New York. Well, she goes to Hyde Park and she comes back with tales of the, of the funeral, uh, which are, I, I could spend 15 minutes on just that, what she told about that funeral. But she, what she couldn't get over was that as they drove up to the presidential library and home where he was buried and where, and where Mrs. Roosevelt's buried together, um, Route 9 was lined with young people. And she had, she had not, she had encapsulated Eleanor 
to use their first names, which of course we never would have done in those days. It was Mrs. Roosevelt and it was Miss Perkins. But she'd encapsulated Eleanor as first lady, both of New York and, and she had not totally opened herself to the role that she'd come to play after FDR died in 1945. And so she said, we really should have had the funeral at St. John the Divine in New York. So uh, it, was, it was a transition. As she said, the, the boys in three days grew up at Telluride after JFK's death. She kind of grew up in the three days after Eleanor's death. And, and she, they, were, they were very close. Um, and they were singular. I mean, they they kind of carried a lot of weight uh, for the role of women in society. Uh, but neither of them was a feminist. They both opposed the ERA. They both were focused not only on the role of women and children, but they were focused on everybody, a common working man. And Mrs. Roosevelt with the Declaration of Human Rights, it was everybody in the world. So. Feminism, as we define it now, I think with both women was too narrow. Their concerns, while they did a lot for women, um, and and Ms. Perkins had had some major women come through the Department of Labor as lawyers. Um, they they both felt the pressure not to be seen just as advocates for women. That would have affected their relationship with men. Just a, uh, one more question after a couple uh, comments, but uh, Derek uh, Liberet just wrote in to remind everybody the title of his book is Unlikely Heroes, Franklin Roosevelt, His Four Lieutenants and the World They Made. And of course, one of the lieutenants is a woman. <laughs> <clears throat> And um, remind everybody that the NNDPA, the Francis Perkins Institute and the uh, Living New Deal put out a book two years ago on uh, titled this in the spirit, the women in the spirit of the New Deal, which if you're interested in the subject of women uh, gaining foothold in the federal government and in politics for the first time uh, during the Franklin and Roosevelt administration. That book is illuminating. And then we have a, a, a question from an esteemed uh, grandson, Tomlin Kagashal, uh, of uh, Francis. How did FDR respond to her letter summarizing their accomplishments and attempting to resign. So Tomlin evidently has some inside purview. <laughs> that is a mark of true friendship. <laughs> he, knows, he knows I didn't finish my script. <laughs> so after in this letter of resignation, which by the way was presented to him by the state of New York in a, in a very broad uh, picture frame with all the five pages. Um, she, by the way, she ends the letter this way. I've recited these items in the hope that the recollection of them will convey to you the reason for my deep appreciation for your vision and your leadership and for the opportunity which you have given me to share in this service to the people of our country. With one major exception, all the items we discussed as among the practical possibilities, quote unquote, before you took office as president have been accomplished or begun. That exception is a social security item providing for some form of benefit to persons where loss of income is due to sickness and provision for appropriate medical care for the same. I hope that this will be upon your agenda for the near future. And then I'm January 22nd, two days after inauguration. The president responds, and, and forgive my accent, but I can't 
read this without. <laughs> Dear Francis, it's a tremendously interesting letter of yours and shows concisely and clearly all that you've accomplished in the Department of Labor. There are many other things to do, matters with which you are familiar. And as I told you on Friday, your resignation is not one of them. It is hereby declined. Indeed, it is rejected and refused. I will see you as soon as I get back. And getting back was getting back from Yalta, uh, which he does in February um, and survives only a few weeks before he dies on April 12th. Thank you, Chris. Uh, do well, you want to say? If that's if that's the end, I want to end on this note because we're going through a debate over Social Security that uh, is very serious, and that is the is the cornerstone of the safety net in this country that Franklin Roosevelt and his lieutenants brought us. And on many occasions, Miss Perkins was asked about Social Security. Um, and on one occasion, this was her response, and I will end on this. When she recalled the origins of the Social Security Act, Perkins said, of course, the act had to be amended and has been amended and amended and amended and amended until it has now grown into a large and important project for which, by the way, I think the people of the United States are deeply thankful. One thing I know, Social Security is so firmly embedded in the American psychology today that no politician, <clears throat> no political party, no political group could possibly destroy this act and still maintain our democratic system. Wow. Let me read that sentence again. Oh. Social Security is so firmly embedded in the American psychology today that no politician, no political party, yes. no political group could possibly destroy this act and pay, still maintain our democratic system. It is safe. It is safe forever and for the everlasting benefit of the people of the United States. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Masterful. My pleasure. <laughs> you want to sign off? I, this is Kathy Lynn saying how honored we are to have you as one of our board members and the capability you have of sharing this wonderful woman's story and all of the things around it. Um, it it's exciting. It's historical beyond all words. Thank you so much, Chris. And our organization thanks you. And I lift a bourbon and branch water to you all. <laughs> <laughs> and we thank the Francis Perkins Institute as well. Oh, absolutely. Francis Perkins Center, let's be correct. Center, right. Yes. After, after June this coming summer, it's going to be available to the public to see the 57 acres that was the home of the Perkins family from 1750 on. And uh, we'll be having programs there uh, that, that carry on her legacy, just as the NNDPA has been carrying on the legacy of the entire New Deal. So thank um, Kathy Flynn again, and thank uh, this audience is approaching 200 and includes many old friends. And I say to all of you, I really appreciate your joining us today. Thank you. Onward. Yes, <laughs> onward and onward and upward. <laughs> okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>